Africa. Professor Ramsey is, is a leader in genomics and bioinformatics research in both South Africa and in the whole continent of Africa. In, in her capacity as both director of the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Biosciences and also as the president of the African Society of Human Genetics, co leading the South African Human Genome Projects and acting as the PI of the Awigen Collaborative Center, Professor Ramsey pursues her interests in African population genetics diversity, exploring genomic and environmental risk factors interplay and also precision medicine applications in the African context. She also pursues these areas through her service as a steering committee member of the HT Africa Consortium, which puts her in the right position to be talking today about these research activities and more in her talk about the upcoming wave of HT genomics data. Welcome, Professor Ramsey, and thank you for joining. Please take the floor. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can you actually hear me? Very much very clear. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for joining and good day to you. Um, so I've chosen the topic for this webinar as anticipating the wave of H3 Africa genomic data. And this is actually very topical because the H3 Africa SNP genotyping array was completed towards the end of 2017 and several groups are now just beginning to get their data. So there's no question that we are going to have this wave of genomic data and we need to think about what the implications are uh, for our consortium but also for better understanding health or the genetic risk for disease on the continent. So if we think, you know, why, why is it important to study um, genomics and genetics in Africa? So I just want you to look very briefly at the statistics that in Africa we have 16% of the world population living on 20% of the land mass. And there's huge diversity among our populations in terms of languages. But on the right hand side of the slide, um, you can see that there are several things which makes it important to actually study genomics in Africa. One is that we have a very high burden of disease, but we also have a paucity of large data sets at many different levels. Um, and therefore, we don't actually have very good estimates of how common diseases are on the continent. When we think about um, obesity, about diabetes, about uh, stroke, we don't really know across the continent how common those traits are. Then we are burdened by low resources and huge political challenges. And what we know is that we have this extensive genetic diversity and much of that can be of potential health relevance. So if we think about the world and we think about all the genomic studies are done, this a brief review by Pope Joy and Fullerton is very interesting because it tells us how things have changed, or more importantly, not changed, over a number of years from 2009 to 2016. So what you can see here is that in 2009, there were about three, uh, just over 370 genome-wide association studies that had been done. And of all the participants that were part of those studies, only 4% were of non-European ancestry. When we look at 2016, many more studies and a lower proportion of African ancestry participants. Um, but before we get too excited about this, we have to look at the actual African ancestry of the participants. And what you can see here is that in 2009, about half a percent of the participants were of African origin most of those being African-American, and that has risen by six times to 3%. Yet, this doesn't really reflect the fact that the world population is 16%. 16 16% of the world population is actually in Africa. So we really don't have a lot of data. So the next two slides are really looking at what genome research is going on in Africa at a genome-wide level. The slide is a little old, so, um, so there may be new studies that are not in here, but I just want you to reflect a little bit on uh, GWAS, or Genome-Wide Association SNP arrays that have been done. So we have uh, malaria gen here. We've got several studies going down that have looked at SNP array data. And when we look at whole genomes, I've actually put here the, the numbers of individuals who've had their whole genome sequenced. So if we look in 2010, the very first two whole human genomes from Africa were sequenced. Then in 2012, we had 15 with the 1,000 Genomes Project. We fortunately have these 700 whole genomes 
that are being used for all sorts of studies um, in many different ways, but they're all of African origin. And then in 2015, we had the African um, Genome Variation Project, where there are 320 individuals for whom there are whole genome sequences. And then, of course, we have um, the Southern African Human Genome Program, and then H3 Africa. And I think many of you are aware that in H3 Africa, uh, through the program, we have now funded about 350 whole genomes from African populations that have been underrepresented in public data. So I think I'm just going to use this opportunity to just um, draw your attention to this paper that we published in December in Nature Communications, which is reporting on 24 whole genomes from South Africa and the interesting information that we've got from that. So you have the reference there, and I hope that some of you will go and look it up. Um, so we need to think about the factors that shape population genetic diversity in general. Because what is, what is certain is that genetic variation contributes to susceptibility to many different diseases, and also to our ability as a population to adapt to the changing environment. So genetic diversity is hugely important. So we generally think that genetic diversity has two ways of coming about. Um, one is through mutation, recombination, genetic drift, and natural selection. So those are all forces acting on variants and their frequency. And then when we look at demographic history, migration has a huge impact on diversity for this example across the continent, but also admixture between populations contributes to genetic diversity. So now we have to think about diseases and how we want to use this genetic diversity to actually understand which variants most contribute to disease. And I've decided to focus this particular presentation on non-communicable diseases. And really those are diseases which require both a genetic risk and a specific environmental trigger um, before they will manifest. And what is important is that genetic risk isn't a single gene and a single mutation, but it is contributed by many variants at many different genes or loci. Um, so that is very important in terms of these non-communicable diseases, that they usually are complex multifactorial traits. And some of the examples are given there as diabetes, stroke, asthma, kidney disease, and there are many more. So it is difficult to estimate what the heritability is of these different traits. And we often use twin studies, and now they are very fancy molecular studies which help us estimate heritability of a trait um, much better. But the more heritable a trait is, the more easily you're going to find the genetic contributions. If the trait has lower heritability and the environment plays a huge role, then you really have to understand the environmental contribution very well. So how do we determine genetic risk for non-communicable diseases? And it's quite interesting that we can look at two different uh, ways of looking at non-communicable diseases, and that can be through the presence or absence of the particular disease like diabetes. You either have diabetes or you don't. And that is when we use um, case control studies. But we can also look at things like quantitative traits. If we want to understand the genetic contribution to height or the genetic contribution to the distribution of um, LDL cholesterol. So, so those are really two different ways of analyzing the data. Um, and that depends very much on the phenotype and how you actually want to develop your study. So when we do these genetic association studies, we, we find genetic associations, but we have to be very careful not to think of them as disease causality, because although those variants can be highly associated with the trait, they don't necessarily cause the trait. And that is because of the concept of linkage disequilibrium, that very often the causal variant that contributes to the trait um, is actually on a stretch of DNA that is inherited together. And that is why we have to be very careful not to get carried away by the most highly associated allele um, if it is in a region that doesn't say very much or if it, is in a, it happens to be in a gene. We have to be very careful about uh, whether we assign causality or not. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, 
the genome-wide association study, GWAS. So it is really about identifying genetic associations by looking at markers throughout the entire genome. So this is a picture that people use very often. So this is saying that um, we are looking for a gene that causes disease. And that is this man looking for his keys. And if we use a candidate gene approach, or we don't use very many markers to look for genetic association, it's analogous to being under the lamppost, where all you can see is the region under the lamppost. And that might not help you uh, find your keys, which are over here, because you can't see them. It's too dark. So in genome-wide association studies, we're not just looking at one region of the genome. What we're doing is we're looking at the entire genome. So it's like lighting up the entire street so that you can then more easily find your keys. So this is really what we do in genome-wide association studies is we are examining the entire genome for association. And that may be a bit of an exaggeration because, of course, it depends on the linkage disequilibrium blocks and the density of the SNPs on your array, whether you are really covering the whole genome. So this particular slide um, is, is telling us um, about some of the interesting differences at the different stages of a genome-wide association study when we're either working in European populations or African populations. And we make a case for the fact that there are very many reasons why studying African populations can be an advantage. So when we think of the different stages of a genome-wide association study, the first step could be considered detecting your association. So that would be very important. Can you find something? Once you've found something, you then need to replicate your study to make sure that it wasn't just spurious or an artifact. And then ideally, what you would like to do is to actually localize the causal variant. And that can be a very difficult thing to do. And you need to do biological studies. And um, there's a lot of work that takes you from finding the association to actually localizing the causal variants. So let's look at the difference now between um, whether you're studying a European or an African population, what would the impact be in terms of detecting association? So in European populations, we have high linkage disequilibrium, which means that our haplotype blocks are very large. And because of this high linkage disequilibrium, we have an increased chance of detecting associations, even if we have arrays that don't have an enormous number of SNPs. But when we look at African populations, the fact that there is low linkage disequilibrium and small haplotype blocks means that we reduce the likelihood of finding and detecting that initial association unless we have an array that is really representative of all the haplotype blocks in the genome. And that may not be possible. So we may actually do a GWAS using our H3 Africa array, which has roughly 2.3 million SNPs. And we could miss an association or um, a signal because there happen to be no SNPs close to some of the loci which have large effects in that particular phenotype. But let's look at how being studying either European or African populations can be relevant in terms of replication of association. So in European populations, there's a good chance of replicating a study or an association, even if a causal variant is not typed. But when you are looking at African populations, you have a reduced likelihood of finding the, the association replicated unless you are actually typing the causal variant or something which is very close to it on the same haplotype block. And then let's look in terms of localizing the causal variant. This can be very difficult when there is high, um, high linkage disequilibrium and maybe much easier when there is low linkage disequilibrium because the haplotype blocks will be smaller. So, so these are some very important differences between studying African and European populations when you're doing genome-wide association studies. So I really liked um, this little commentary that was written in Nature last year uh, by Terry Manolio. And it was looking at this tide of genome-wide association studies and how we're having uh, globally more and more studies that, for example, have um, more than 50,000 participants. And you can imagine that this will be going up. And we haven't published any of our H3 Africa data yet, but we're hoping certainly to contribute to this rise in studies through H3 Africa. 
So when we look at GBOS studies, um, in general, the associations explain only a small fraction of the heritability of a trait, and most of the associations are in regions of the genome that don't have a known function. And, and that is very important because I think when we have expectations of H3 Africa and doing our genome-wide association studies, we have to be realistic in terms of what we are likely to find. So when we think about um, genome-wide association studies, these are really non-hypothesis-based exploratory research. So, so we're not starting off by saying for this particular disease, we expect to find this gene and that gene or genes in this pathway. We, we're literally saying we don't, we don't care and we just want to find everything that is associated with our um, trait of interest. And that is why it's exploratory. And I think you know, it's just the first step in trying to understand the biology of a disease. So, so it's, it's good to, to know that, that there's a lot of work to be done beyond just getting the associations. So when we do a genome-wide association study, we're examining genetic associations throughout the whole genome, and we're looking at associations with the particular phenotype. So what we need to do is to look for highly significant associations, because we have a huge multiple testing problem. So our p-values have to be very small for there to be a likelihood that the, that the association is actually real. And then, as I've said before, the associations are seldom causal factors, that they're usually the causal factors that contribute to the trait are usually in linkage disequilibrium with whatever the best associated SNP is. And then just to come to this whole story about sample size and the fact that if you have a small sample size in your GWAS study, you will miss important genetic determinants that have a minor effect on the phenotype. And that can be overcome by increasing your sample size. So worldwide, we've seen this trend of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of participants. And what you will see is that more and more genetic loci are attached to the phenotype because we have the power to identify variants with very small effects on the phenotype. So I just wanted to pause a little bit and talk about um, the design of a genome-wide association study. And of course, what is really important is the trait that you choose to study. And you have to understand if there may be things that influence that trait that could be confounding variables that will make it less likely for you to find true associated genetic variants. And the trait, as I mentioned before, could either be dichotomous, that you have people either having the trait or not having the trait, or it could be based on a continuous variable or a, qu a quantitative trait. So that is what will determine which study design you use. Then you have to think about your study sample size. How many participants can you realistic put in to your study? And that depends on a lot of things. I think most often it depends on the funding that you have available, because I think all of us would like to have studies as big as we can possibly afford. And often what we can afford is not big enough to give us enough power to identify variants with small effects. The sample size is really important, and one has to think about that relative to the power of your study when you go in for a grant application and long before you start analyzing your data. And one has to consider the issue of population stratification. So it's important to understand whether your cases and controls or your sample as a whole are, very, are made up of individuals who are genetically very similar or whether there actually may be groups of individuals that are very different. So it's very important to understand that. Then you have to think about what SNP array are you going to choose? And I think we're really delighted that H3 Africa decided that it needed an African enriched SNP array for our studies. So SNP arrays are looking at individual SNPs that are usually chosen based on specific criteria. And it's usually because they're relatively common because if your allele frequency is too low, it means that you don't have enough power to test that variant. And uh, so the SNP array choice is very important. If you're working in an African setting, 
It's best to use a SNP that is enriched for common variation in the African population. But we now have very good statistical methods of enriching the data that we get from a SNP array, and that is through the process of imputation. So that is based on the probability of given certain SNPs and genotypes, what are the chances that you will have specific genotypes at other loci that are very close to the SNP that you have interrogated. And here the choice of imputation panel is very important. And I'm going to show you an example of, of where it matters to have African genomes in your imputation panel if you're trying to impute um, data into a SNP array data set. You have to think about the relatedness of your participants because that could influence your results. And you may want to at times do sex stratified analysis because we're learning more and more that whether you are male or female can affect the way that your physiology or biology works. And so it's very important for some things like, for example, obesity, to analyze your data sets separately. It's sometimes not enough to just put in sex as a confounder because you may then miss things that are very male specific or female specific. And then of course, we would love to understand gene environment interactions, but our statistical ability to um, identify these is not very well developed. So I think we need um, more methods to actually understand good gene environment interactions, but there are some excellent examples. So this is just going back again to our study design. If you have a quantitative trait, you're looking at a continuous phenotypic spectrum. And some of the examples there are height, lipid levels, blood pressure. And the effect there is measured by a beta value. So the higher the beta value, the higher the effect that this particular genetic variant has on the phenotype. So when we do case control studies, we're obviously separating our study cohort into two groups. And that could be, for example, people with diabetes or people who don't have diabetes, i.e. the controls. Same for hypertension and the presence of hypertension or absence of hypertension. And what is very important here is to think very carefully about what you are using to diagnose your individuals either as having or not having a particular trait. So if, for example, you are using fasting glucose to determine whether somebody has diabetes or not, you have to be very clear that, that the cutoff is actually reasonable because you're using a quantitative measurement to actually decide if a person has or does not have diabetes. And that is why we need to work very closely with our clinicians who would use a more complex algorithm to actually classify participants into the case, case category or the control category. And when you're doing case control studies, there we're measuring the effect through an odds ratio. So for example, we will look at allelic association and come up with an odds ratio. So if the odds ratio is one, it means that that particular variant has no effect on the phenotype. If the odds ratio is 1.1, it could mean that that particular variant has a small effect on the phenotype. And then as the odds ratio increases, we know that the effect of that particular variant on the phenotype is larger. But some of you might have noticed that sometimes you have an odds ratio that's less than one. And what that's really telling us is that the variant that you're associating with the trait is actually not associated with increased risk for the disease, but with decreased risk for the disease. The odds ratio that is bigger, says the allele under interrogation, is, is associated with increased risk for the trait, whereas an odds ratio of minus one tells you that in fact the variant that you're interrogating is associated with a lower risk for the trait. And that is why it's very important to know which allele you're actually looking at. And that is not always very clear when one looks at the GWAS catalog, that there are sometimes instances where you can't actually figure out which the effect allele is. Because the contribution to the trait is not really the gene, it is the variant um, at that particular gene that is either increasing or decreasing, um, associated with either an increase or a decrease risk. So that is very important to understand. So this particular slide um, tells us about how there are different things that impact the power of your study. And you'll recall that when I said, you know, when you're designing a study, it's really important to know 
what you are powered to detect and not to detect. So there are a couple of things that I'd like to illustrate with these two um, graphs. So first of all, when you're thinking about study power, there's, there are at least three things to consider. One is the sample size. Of course, the bigger the sample size, the more power you're going to have. The next one would be allele frequency. If your allele frequency is very low, given a specific sample size, you're going to be less powered than if your allele frequency is higher. So for example, if the allele is 0 0.01, you may not be powered in a study of 5,000 participants. But if your allele frequency is 0 0.3, you may be powered for the same sample size to identify an effect. And then, very importantly, the bigger the effect size, the more likely you are to find it, given a specific sample size. So we know that in GBOS, and I said that before, that mostly the effect sizes are small for complex traits. And that is why we need substantive sample sizes to actually um, find associations. So the two graphs, the one shows the situation with the minor allele frequency of 0.05, and the other one with the minor allele frequency of 0.2. So you can see already when you compare the left to the right that the power, which is on the y-axis, is increased when you have a higher allele frequency. So everything else is the same. So I think what I'm going to do is just focus now on a minor allele frequency of 0.05. So what you can see is that this is modeled um, a sample size of 5,000 going right up to a sample size of 55,000 participants. This is for a quantitative trait, so that is why we have a beta value. And each of the lines here represents a different beta value. So this is a small effect size of 0 0.01. This is a slightly bigger effect size of 0 0.02 and, and so forth. So what you can see is that if you look at the a very small effect, if you have 5,000 participants, your ability to detect that is only going to be less than 10%. So you're going to be less than 10% powered. If you have 55,000 55, participants in your study, you're going to have over 40% power. But that means that you still don't have a lot of power to detect really tiny effects. On the other hand, if you have a beta value of 0.2, you are still underpowered with 5,000 but you have over 95% power to detect an effect uh, to detect um, the effect if you have 55,000 participants. So that gives you some kind of idea of how you would um, try and examine power. So it would depend a lot on the sample size, the allele frequency, and the effect size of the variant that you're looking at. So now I'm switching to one of our big um, sort of genome projects that gives us African data, and I'm just going to unpack this for you a little bit. So the African Genome Variation Project um, did both genotyping and also whole genome sequencing. So in terms of genotyping, there is data on 18 different ethnolinguistic groups, and those are shown on the right, and those represent um, almost 1,500 individuals from Sub-Saharan Africa, and they were all typed with the Illumina SNP array that had roughly 2.5 million SNPs. But there was also whole genome sequence data available um, for the African Genome Variation Project. And if you look at the um, arrows on the right here, you can see that in African populations, there are, from the 1,000 Genomes uh, Project, there are certain um, populations that have whole genome sequence, Yoruba and Maluya. And then from the AGVP, there are three extra populations, so Ethiopians, Uganda from Uganda, and the Zulu from South Africa, that have whole genome sequences. This, I think, has changed now. There are more 1,000 genomes, African whole genome data sets. But the whole genome sequencing was low coverage, an average of 4x coverage. And that included 320 individuals from seven ethnolinguistic groups spanning three countries. So, so the Ethiopians had multiple linguistic groups in their group. So um, what did they find in terms of variation? 
So if you look at that, in terms of all the variations that they found in these just over three, uh, 300 people, they found almost 30 million variants. And of those 30 million variants, about a third, about 10 million, were actually novel. They had not previously been seen before this project was done. So this really makes us think again about the fact that there's so much to be discovered in African populations by looking at a relatively small number of individuals you can discover an enormous number of novel variants. And just to take you back to the Southern African Human Genome Project, there we were actually able to detect about 800,000 novel variants. Um, but I think, of course, the more information we get, the less, li the less the likelihood of finding novel things. But what is really important is that the novel variants are mostly population specific, as you can see in this chart here, and they're usually rare. So, so I think it will take a long time for us to find all the variation in the world because you'd have to sequence everybody. But the more you sequence Africans, I think the more you are likely to find novel variants, even though they may be rare um, in those populations. So that brings me to the whole issue of um, population stratification. So you can see here a principal component analysis of participants from Africa. And you can see on um, the x-axis, which explains 21% of the, um, the variants, that there's a split. These are Ethiopian individuals. These are other African individuals from southern, eastern, and western Africa. And they are the ones that split out when you get your principal component uh, two. And so if you are doing a study and you have individuals who come from western, eastern, and south Africa, you have to think very carefully about the analysis that you're going to use to analyze your GWAS because you have to take into account this background diversity um, and, and therefore you have to use a slightly different approach. So I wanted to um, just look at this issue of imputation accuracy a little bit in terms of understanding how important it is to have the right reference genomes for imputation. So this is from the supplementary material in the um, AGVP paper. And it talks about um, imputation for the IGBO from Nigeria and the SUTU from South Africa. And when you look at the solid lines, that is um, if you use a merge data set, which includes the AGVP data and the thousand genomes data. And when it is the dashed line, it's only the thousand genomes data. So the blue is the SUTU, the red is the IGBO. So what you can see when you look at the IGBO is that there doesn't seem to be a difference when you do imputation using the 1,000 genomes data only, or if you add the AGVP data, there's no difference in, in imputation quality. But what you notice when you look at the SUTU data, if you're going to do imputation, if you only use the 1,000 genomes data, the imputation is not nearly as good as when you include the AGVP data, because the AGVP data included Southern African genomes, the Zulu and the Sutu. So that just shows you that by using the right um, reference panel, you enhance your ability to do good imputation. This slide now illustrates the gene environment interaction. So what we're doing is in this axis, we're looking at the relative risk that you might have a particular disease. So up here would be high risk, down here would be low risk of getting this particular disease. So you can look at your population as a whole and some, some individuals will have low genetic risk and other individuals will have high genetic risk. But irrespective of whether you have low or high genetic risk, you may have an environment which is either low or high in terms of risk for a particular condition. So um, let's say, for example, it is cardiovascular disease and it's genetic or genotype risk for cardiovascular disease and a higher environmental risk factor might be, for example, smoking and being overweight. So or eating too much and having too little exercise, really. So you can see that somebody who um, has a low-risk genotype and a low-risk environment will have a generally low risk. And somebody who has a high-risk genotype and is practicing or in a high-risk environment will have a much higher risk. 
and the risk could be the same for low and high risk genotypes if they have opposite environmental risks. So you can see how important this is. And again, this for different traits, there will be different proportions of genetic environmental risk that contribute to the trait. So the genetic risk, of course, being the heritability of the trait. So here's an example of type 2 diabetes, and um, which is, of course, a complex multifactorial trait. And you can have a situation where you um, use a case control study design and you're looking for allelic association. So what you will find are many genetic variants that each make a small contribution to the phenotype. And they may, in fact, together account for only a small proportion of the variability of the trait. And for that reason, they're often not highly predictive. So if you tease this out a little bit and you take an example of one SNP that is associated with a particular phenotype, so here it is diabetes. So each of the pie charts here represents a population and it represents the allele frequency in that particular population. So you can see that in Africa, the blue allele dominates and that happens to be the allele that is associated with a high risk for type 2 diabetes. And in some areas of the world, the non-risk allele is more common. So this could tell you generally that in terms of this particular variant, Africans may be disproportionately um, at risk for developing type 2 diabetes. But of course, you can't only look at one variant at a time. It's really important that you look at very, very many variants together. And that is actually what was done in this analysis, which is part of the, the PhD of a student um, some years ago in our department. And this is what the study design was. So this was really looking at genetic risk score. So it was using an additive model. So for every risk allele you have, your score increases in terms of your genetic susceptibility for diabetes. So the first step was to use the GWAS catalog to find disease-associated SNPs. The second was to identify the risk alleles, which is not always an easy thing to do. Then to access open access data like 1,000 genomes. And then to calculate the additive risk per person. And then to examine in terms of a continental distribution whether they are similar or different. So in this study, 157 diabetes-associated SNPs were used. And so at each SNP, people have the ability to have two SNPs, one that is maternally inherited and one that is paternally inherited. So you can imagine that if you're counting risk alleles, the number of potential risk alleles has to be double the number of SNPs. So you can see at the bottom here is the number of risk alleles. And on the y-axis here is the fraction of individuals that have that number of risk alleles. And then the colors represent in blue European populations, in red Asian populations, and in green African populations. And what you can see here is that there appears to be a shift towards the right in terms of higher genetic risk for type 2 diabetes in African populations. But this needs to be understood better because the studies for discovering these SNPs were mainly done in European populations, and we have to demonstrate first that those alleles are also, those alleles and SNPs are also associated with a high risk for diabetes in African populations. So this was a sort of a rough and ready analysis, and one would need to do this much more carefully to try and understand um, whether individuals originating from one content, continent, in fact, have higher or lower risk than those from another continent. So what expectations should we have from um, GWAS studies? If we have a modest sample size, we can examine previous associations and test for similar effects. With a, modern sample, a modest sample size, we can also detect novel things, provided that they have a large effect. But with large sample sizes, we can discover even novel, modest, or small effect um, associations. So what we really need to do and what we want to do is to explore insights into biology through the genetic association and we really want to understand what impact African populations can bring to this understanding. So I've got three examples. I can see that the time is ticking quite quickly. So I'm going to go through the, these examples. So one is a modest study 
about obesity among Samoans. The other is a very large study on blood pressure using UK Biobank data. And then just a little bit about integrating the science and using genome association studies to actually look at obesity. So this is the example of a modern genomic study on obesity and high effect variants. So we know that Samoans are a population with some of the highest prevalence of obesity. You can see here that the discovery study had just over 3,000 participants and there was a replication study. They discovered a really high effect missense variant. And you can look at the p-value here and see how significant this association was in the meta-analysis that they did. And interestingly enough, the variant or the allele that, that contributes to obesity is present at a frequency of almost 3% in Samoans. And it's extremely rare, like less, less than 1% or 0.1% in most other populations. And the effect size may not look hugely significant to you, but it is like one and a half BMI units per risk allele. So if you had one copy of the risk allele, on average, you would have 1.5 BMI units higher. But if you had two copies, you could have as many as three. But of course, you can't do direct cause and effect. This is really about describing the effects in a population. And this gave some very interesting biological insight and supported the hypothesis of a thrifty variant um, for uh, obesity in this population. So you can, you can read um, the effect there in terms of the biology and the cell studies. This is what the GWAS looked like. So you can see your Manhattan plot here. And then you can see after imputation, um, the missense variant here um, still coming up very high. And it would be interesting to interrogate some of the other variants that also reached the threshold level. And this is just looking at the different genotypes at this highly associated locus in terms of BMI in males and females. And you can see in general in Samoa, women are more likely to have a higher BMI than men. So you want to actually look at sex-specific effects. And it's important to ask the question about how predictive are these alleles for obesity? And of course, then the novel insight that we've gained. This is the next study. And I'm going to go through these slides quickly, but I know you will have access to them afterwards so you can look at them more carefully. So this is really looking at um, genome-wide association with blood pressure. So the quantitative uh, trait was uh, looking at systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and pulse pressure. And it was not specifically designed to be about hypertension. But what you will see at the end of the study is they actually related it back to risk for hypertension. So we know that blood pressure is a heritable, modifiable, a heritable, a strong heritable and modifiable driver of things like stroke and coronary artery disease. And to date, over 120 common variants with small effects have been associated with this phenotype. And this gives you the details of the study, but I'm just going to take you to the green bit over here, which is to say that given the study, which is large, 140,000 people, using 10 million SNPs after imputation, what they managed to do was to validate, um, to show that the validated loci increased the percentage of the trait variants that you can be that you can explain by about one percent and that seems incredible with all this data that you can get these um, 107 highly associated variants and that all together they only increase your blood pressure by one percent so if we look at a genetic risk score using those 107 highly associated loci what do we find so what they did here was that they used hypertension as a phenotype now, and they define how they define that. And they looked at um, people in five different quintiles from the lowest to the highest risk for, for hypertension. And um, they then looked at the genetic risk score and showed, in fact, that the higher your genetic risk score, the higher your likelihood of having hypertension. So you can have an odds ratio of 2.32 for hypertension if you are in the highest quintile compared to the lowest quintile. And then they did the same thing for 
cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and stroke. But of course, when you get these associations, it's all very well trying to think that you can have a genetic risk um, and that you can identify individuals who are at high risk in a particular population. But what you really want to understand is the relationship between genetic risk and the biology and behavior if that is important in your trait. And this is what they come up with. So you can see the GWAS right at the bottom of this very complex chart and how you can look at the GWAS to identify genes. But you also want to understand the molecular phenotypes. You want to understand the, the physiology. You want to know which organs are involved. You need to know about the individual behavior. And then you can also deduce certain things about populations like they did for the Samoan population. So now I'm taking you all the way back to H3 Africa. And in H3 Africa, there are several studies that are looking at non-communicable diseases. So these are six different studies focusing on different phenotypes, kidney disease, cardiometabolic disease, cervical cancer, stroke, diabetes, rheumatic heart disease. And all of them have aspects of cardiovascular disease. And by pooling our joint data and participants, there are certain traits that we can interrogate because we've all measured them. One of the examples being BMI, another one being hypertension. So we are increasing our probability of finding low effect variants by pooling our data in H3 Africa. So this is very, very um, important and powerful. So we have put together these, um, these six groups and we formed something that we call the Cardiovascular H3 Africa Innovation Resource or CHAIR. And what you can see here are the recruitment sites across Africa that include the participants from all six of those studies. Together, there will be over 50,000 participants with harmonized phenotypes. So not everybody will have every phenotype, but there will be good overlap. And besides the phenotype data, we also have behavioral data. Um, amongst those individuals are many population controls that can be used for other association studies. So if somebody's doing a cancer study, for example, and they want to look at genetic association, they only need to do the H3 Africa array on their, case, on their cases. And they can use the control sample from this resource as their controls when they do a GWAS case control study. And so, of course, with the increased sample size, we have more power for novel discovery. So when we think of the impact, it's really taking us the whole spectrum from no risk alleles for cardiovascular disease right through to mortality. And what we would really like to be able to do is to identify the individuals with no risk or single risk and understand how many of them are going to progress to, to establish cardiovascular disease or mortality and to then motivate those individuals for behavioral change that will maximize their chances for a healthy uh, life for longer. So when we think about the package that contributes to cardiovascular disease, it's about non-modifiable risk factors. So your genetics you can't change, your sex you can't change, your age you can't change, to modifiable risk factors, which are lifestyle, education, many different things. And then the use of indicators of risk, like biomarkers, for example, lipid levels, or clinical data like blood pressure, which can give you some kind of indication of your um, physiological risk, which is usually also a combination of genetic risk and um, risky environment. So that brings me to the conclusions. And I just would like to go through this. I know I've exceeded my 45 minutes, but hopefully you'll bear with me. So. Genetic associations for complex multifactorial traits is indeed complex. So what we can say is that non-communicable diseases are caused both by genetic risk variations, variants um, in combination with environmental effects. So that's why it's so difficult to find these associations. It's much easier if heritability is high to find associated loci when heritability is low it's much more difficult and then you have to look very carefully at minimizing the phenotypic variability in your cohort. And then to make the point again that when we do GWAS 
studies, we often find highly associated loci that have small effects. And what we really have to remember is that by studying those loci or testing them in individuals doesn't make them good predictors of the phenotype. So you really need to have a holistic understanding of a trait to understand what role the genetic risk plays to know whether you can use it as a predictor of phenotype or future phenotype. I think the two study designs we've dwelled on quite a lot and then again understanding that genetic association with a particular SNP is not necessarily indicating that that SNP is causal or contributes to the disease. Um, they, they are often the associated loci are there because they are uh, proxies for the causal variant through the concept of linkage disequilibrium. And then really what we want to do through all this work in H3 Africa is to understand how African studies can actually contribute to the landscape of understanding the biology behind complex diseases that are on the increase um, even in Africa. And with that, I'll come to the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for your patience. I'm very happy to take some questions well, um, if you'd like to type them on the left-hand side. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ramsey, for this great talk, actually, and thorough coverage of this subject. Uh, the floor is now open for questions from the audience, and you may ask questions directly by unmuting your microphones. Just click on the microphone symbol in the upper part of the window, or you can type in the chat area to the left of the screen. At least some people are typing already. Thank you, Alia. <laughs> I know it was a lot to digest in 45 minutes, and you know, there's so many areas that need more unpacking. Um, but at least you've got good references there that you can go back to and um, go and read. So um, this person, so Yosh, is asking about um, the GWAS threshold for association studies in African populations. If it is uh, 10 to the minus 8 for Caucasians after Bonferroni correction in Africa, will it be different? So I think um, the GWAS threshold is often put there by the number of SNPs that you're actually interrogating because you want to get rid of this multiple testing um, phenomenon that is, has the potential of causing artifactual um, or false positives. So if you are using the same number of SNPs for a Caucasian population or an African population, you would still use the same cutoff. So um, many of the studies that use the 10 to the minus 8 cutoff are based on 2.5 million SNPs um, because that is one of the arrays that is very often used. So, so Samir, you were saying, um, were you asking the question or were you saying? You asked the question. Okay, it's worse. Oh. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for this uh, great and nice presentation. Uh, I have just like one question or like uh, it's, it's quite a suggestion also. Uh, what is the part of uh, other, other approaches for genome-wide association studies? Because here we can see through this presentation that uh, uh, genome-wide single SNP association uh, are very good, but they are likely to detect only uh, for like monogenic uh, traits or simple traits. But once we are working on multifactorial complex traits, uh, we should uh, push to develop uh, all these uh, multi-marker approaches for GWAS, like uh, checking for interaction, for joint, joint SNP effects, and we will have, like, uh, I think, a more statistical power to identify association between traits and a group of SNPs rather than between the trait and a single SNP. Thank you, Mamadou. So in the GWAS, we're doing multiple pairwise comparisons. So for every one of the 2.5 million SNPs, you're comparing the SNP with the phenotype. 
So you're doing lots of comparisons and you usually end up with a handful or more associated SNPs. And it's quite right that if you put them together, their predictive power or their association together would be larger in terms of the phenotype. So it is very important that we look at um, gene-gene interactions, that we look at potential gene-environment interactions to really unpack and understand the biology. So for a complex trait, it's no use testing a single variant to try and predict whether somebody's going to get it or not. And you saw in that blood pressure study that even if you test 107 variants all together in one person, and you, you can then put their risk into the first, second, third, fourth, fifth quintile. So, so you're quite right that you've got to look at it more um, holistically. I'm just going to look at some of the other questions. Um, there was one from Samuel. Please, can you talk a little more on the cautions we need to take to analyze GWAS data from West Africa? So, um, so very interesting. I mean, we, we don't know a lot about um, genetic variation in West Africa. And if you are working only in West Africa, a good understanding of ethnic diversity, which may be reflected in the biology and the genetics, is important. So you have to take into consideration, um, for example, principal component analysis to see whether you need to build into your GWAS uh, part of the methodology that will correct for ethnicity. So, um, so I think, you know, probably not different to any other region, except that it's important to understand how much diversity there is. Are there very different ethno-linguistic groups that might cause a problem in terms of population stratification if you do a case control study and you don't have equal numbers of individuals representing the different groups? So I think just the caution, make sure that you look at um, at the ethnicity and the uh, principal component analysis when you're doing those studies in West Africa. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yes. Yes. Th thank you. Thank you for this uh, clarification. Yes, definitely. In West Africa, we um, we we have like in our court we have uh, genotype data based on sheep, and we also have sequence data from our own population so it will be more precise for imputation we haven't yet done the imputation step but uh, uh, we will uh, impute based on our uh, on some some of the founders from our own population so and we expect to find like uh, uh, more very more variants new variants maybe that will that will not be uh, found if we use like as a reference population like we ha we expect nice things uh, in the future on that and we will let you know uh, thank you again for this nice talk thank you mamadou and just to give you the good news in the 350 whole genome sequences that were done under the umbrella of h3 africa there were 60 individuals from west africa about half from Burkina faso and half from ghana so that will go into an African imputation panel as well. So I think the fact that you have additional data is fantastic, and I hope that you'll engage with um, the BioNet group about the possibility of also including that in the um, imputation panel, because I think the more data you have, the better the imputation actually gets. Yes, right, exactly. Exactly. Thanks. Um, so Right, so um, Bruno, you asked in, in this kind of study, some of the variants may be missing in some of the areas, or if you do, how does that affect estimates of GWAS? So it's true that the, the H3 Africa array was based on common variation in African populations, but it's possible that many of the SNPs will be monomorphic in your group because the array the array was put together was it also used other um, pools of SNPs that maybe are not very common in African populations or maybe absent. So you do lose uh, some of the SNPs because of that. Um, so, so you may want to adjust your multiple testing um, threshold based on the number of SNPs that survive in your data set. 
but I think my feeling is, um, you know, when you do 2.3 million SNPs, you actually do lose quite a lot of them through quality control and also through um, very low allele frequency. Because when you clean your data after you have your genotyping data, one of the cutoffs you may use is um, if the allele frequency is less than 0.1%, you may um, not use that particular variant in your GWAS study. And then Sarah is asking yes. another question. And um, Sarah is saying, how could we link the study with proteomics or use proteomics in this study? So um, that is why I just put in that one slide about the obesity. And it's a wonderful review in Nature Reviews Genetics that just came out in December last year. And it gives you all those different layers about, you know, it's all fine having the gene, but then you want to know in the variant of the gene, what is happening in terms of the function of the, the variant, how does that impact on biology? And then you want to know if it affects, for example, gene expression, um, how does that then translate to protein quantity or the quality of the protein in terms of its function? So I think we really, Sarah, would like to integrate all of that information. And that is why in H3 Africa, we need to know, you know, obviously we're not going to stop after the genome-wide associations and the genetic association. We really want to unpack and understand the biology, because I think that also best informs interventions for greater health. Well, I think thank you, Professor uh, Ramsey, for this great presentation, and thank you for all the interactions. Um, I can see we are running a bit um, over the time, so um, I would really like to thank you, Professor Ramsey, again. and everyone. Thank you for joining today, um, and I really encourage you to be engaged more, maybe in upcoming H3 Africa projects and African Society uh, projects as well to get more and be in this revolution of genomics going on in Africa. Um, I um, I really hope that this has been quite fruitful today. The presentation has been recorded, and we will, uh, in due time, post it in appropriate YouTube, YouTube channel. Uh, we hope to see you again this time next month in another few presentations. And best wishes from us, the webinar teams, and the larger 53A uh, Biomet uh, Consortium. So, bye, everyone.